This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. What I'm going to do today is something that um, I've been talking about for a while. Based on you know what we know from the Big Bang, could you predict that I would be standing there next to that space suit at NASA headquarters? As usual, why don't we put down the lights a little bit? That way, you know, you can get a little bit of a nap um, if you need to, and just you know, don't snore. Um, so what I'm going to do is take some of what you've already learned the last couple of weeks from the Big Bang all the way through the planets, and mostly focusing, of course, on life, and say, all right. Now that we've, we've got new life, we've even talked a little about panspermia, let's go back again and say, what would happen if all life on Earth were wiped out? Or what if it happened again? And it's probably likely that it has happened more than once in the universe. How much could we predict about what we see here today um, would come true if we, if we played it again? Um, now, we would probably not be sitting here in a classroom at Stanford. But there are certain general patterns that I think I'm, I'm going to at least argue that you will see. And um, this is somewhat idiosyncratic. This is not completely published. But I was very fortunate in that um, a year or so ago, I was invited to give a talk at a Royal Society <coughs> meeting in London, which I did last November. And the meeting was on photosynthesis, which I do periodically, but not often. Um, not me personally, naturally, I don't photosynthesize. The green sweater is actually a sweater. Um, but nonetheless, I, I thought, what am I going to say? And particularly since they wanted me last. And usually the last speaker at a conference is supposed to be a, you know, an old man with a gray beard. He says, you know, when I got my degree in 1936, we were, you know. So, and, and obviously, I'm not in a position to do that. In fact, it was kind of funny. I realized I was the only woman at the entire conference. So I was sort of in a position of being the old man at the, you know, as the one woman. Anyway, so what I thought I'd do is say, all right, you know, we've all talked about photosynthesis from different angles. What if, again, we replayed the tape? Would photosynthesis arise another time? So what I did this morning is, rather than that being one slide of this lecture as it was last year, it's gone the other way around. I've taken this full talk, which then I, I gave the next week in the Netherlands, and squished it into the middle of last year's and got rid of some of the extrania. So hopefully it'll flow smoothly. Um, and again, uh, some of this you'll have seen before. In fact, you'll have seen some of these actual slides before from last week. Um, hopefully you remember them. But what I'm going to do is put them together in a totally different way so we can tweak your mind and stretch it a little bit. So let's, uh, let's get started. And um, we'll try to take a break in the middle as usual. Ah, got to start the presentation. Voila. OK, so we're going to say knowing what the, the physical and biological environment was in the Earth, um, is evolution contingent? Is the quirks of history. And we're going to argue that this is really important to understanding all aspects of astrobiology. What it's really getting down to is the question is, are there laws in biology or astrobiology? We all know that there are laws in physics. And um, you probably thought there were all laws in chemistry, but we talked about chemistry as being a changing subject, too. Um, subject matter, I should say, not a changing subject. Um, but there's a tendency to think, well, in biology, there are no laws. But maybe laws are just a sort of prediction of a certain outcome. Maybe it's a statistical proposition. For example, I could say that um, I, would, I would say that maybe 80% of you in the room will have children sometime in your life. Now, I can't go through and say, you, you, not you, 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 not you, not you. Um, I have no idea, but I can feel fairly certain that that's you know, roughly the number, more or less, that are going to have children. And I certainly can't predict whether they're going to be boys or girls, but statistically, um, there'll be slightly more boys born than girls, but there'll be slightly more girls by the time they reach age 60 or so. Um, in fact, probably much younger than that. So again, I can't go through the room and say, you're going to have three daughters, you're going to have a son, you're going to have one of each, and so on. I, I can't do that. But what I can do is give you some sort of statistical average. So maybe that's good enough in evolution. There certainly are things that are called laws. We talk about um, laws of, for example, organisms tending to be bigger if they're warm-blooded as they go towards the poles. 
because if, if you need to stay warmer, you want to decrease your surface area to volume ratio. But are these really, you know, are these really laws? We're, we're going to sort of play with some of those ideas. And of course, this is crucial to astrobiology. You've seen this slide before with just different coloring. I keep changing the coloring to keep you awake. But we're looking at the history of life, and that happened once here. But it gives us some idea when we discuss this whether the history would be the same elsewhere. Are we alone, therefore? And if we're not alone, what life might be like elsewhere? And what's going to happen in the future? Um, some of the main characters in, in these sorts of arguments over the last few years have been um, Stephen Jay Gould. He's written a couple of books, wrote a couple of books that touched on, on these subjects. Um, Wonderful Life is one of them. Um, full, full House, I believe, is the other one. And we had a directed reading course a couple of years ago where we, we sat down and we read through all these, which was great fun, and, and I'd be delighted to do it again. It, it was a great book. Um, he talked a lot about this and brought up the whole metaphor of replaying the tape. And what he argued was that there were all sorts of quirks and contingencies in evolution, things that just sort of happened. Um, you know, an asteroid drops on the Earth one day, and it's a really bad hair day for the dinosaurs. That just happened. It's nothing that you could have predicted from dinosaur physiology or competition with other dinosaurs or with mammals or whatever. It was just incredibly bad luck. These are just things that happened, but it obviously altered the entire trajectory of history of life on this Earth. Um, I'm, I'm now doing a gross characterization of both of them. Simon Conway Morris, um, who is a professor at the University of Cambridge, Stephen Jay Gould was a professor at Harvard University, who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, Simon is in Cambridge, and he says it's really not very important if you look at um, a lot of the details, but there are general patterns. And if you look at convergence, which we'll talk about a lot today, you can start to see these patterns emerge. Who has an idea what I'm talking about by convergence? Oh, uh, isn't that when I'm related by descent and was converted to like the same adaptation? Mm -hmm. like, Animals, yeah. plants, protists, bacteria, doesn't, doesn't have to even be an animal. Yeah. Right, exactly. So you converge on this, for those who are more engineeringly oriented in this room, you converge on the same solution to a problem. Do you remember an example that I gave in the extremophile lecture of convergence? I may not have used the word. Pardon? Antifreeze in the blood. Great, that wasn't even what I was thinking of, but you're absolutely right. Good. Um, pH, organisms that live in acidic environments, all making proton pumps, but coming at it convergently. And by the way, for those who are biologists here who don't feel happy until they hear what John Maynard Smith has to say, um, he says a series of historical accidents subject to engineering constraints. And if you, the funny thing is, Steve and Simon, who I, I know, knew both of them, and so I, I try to stay in the middle here, really if you read them carefully are saying fairly similar things, but unfortunately had quite a battle over a, a lot of these issues. And so that's why I show them in different slides. But if you look at this carefully, I think they're all saying basically what I'm going to say, and that is that the details we couldn't predict. Again, you couldn't predict, you probably couldn't have even predicted 10 years ago you'd be at Stanford, much less, you know, if we started three and a half or four billion years ago that you would end up at Stanford. But that in a general sort of outline, we might have predicted something like a mammal or a vertebrate might have arisen, or maybe not even that much. But you can't, you don't, you don't have an infinite number of possibilities is what someone like John Maynard Smith saying because we're living organisms. There's only so big we can be because of engineering constraints on weight on our bones and surface area to volume ratio constraints and so on. So again, we, we need the engineers of the class. <coughs> now, I'm going to bring up this book and I think there's a copy in the library, but I. If not, I, I actually have a copy. This was written by Dougal Dixon, who is not actually a, a, a practicing biologist. But it's a really fun book. It's called After Man, the Zoology of the Future. And what he does is take evolutionary principles, if you don't want to call them laws, and goes on the conceit that, that humankind is extinct. What's going to happen to whatever's left? And it's, it's really a lot of fun looking to see how these various other organisms from rats and all the other ones that are going to make it through 
um, evolve to fill the niches that are now open. And so I'm going to pass this around if you want to glance at some of the pictures. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, anyway, is, I think there's also a copy in the library. Um, so what he does is he takes some of these rules that I was talking about, Bergman's rules, where you get related or organisms that are closer to the poles are going to be larger to cut down the um, surface area volume ratio, Allen's rule, where you end up shrinking your limbs as you get towards a colder area because, again, you don't want to have a large amount of surface area to volume ratio because that cuts down on heat loss. So certain things like that. And, and again, it's not a law. Someone doesn't say to you, here's the law, shorten your limb if you want to move towards the poles. We just see this happening over and over again. Okay, so now that we've um, danced around this a little bit, let's start from the beginning, the usual the Big Bang. What of this are we going to see again, assuming the universe is like it is today? You know, we could start tweaking it, we could start tweaking the weak force and the strong forces and so on, and it wouldn't take very much tweaking to make a universe that would be completely uninhabitable. It wouldn't take much to have a universe where we couldn't even build molecules. So let's just assume that we're at least had the Big Bang and we're starting off about the same. Um, so by the time you have a planet in a second generation of stars, because remember, in the first generation from the Big Bang, you have hydrogen, helium, and a tiny bit of lithium, which would make, um, make a person that was full of hot air, I guess. Um, but what you really want is to have the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on. So you need a generation of stars to have a supernova. Okay, so now we're going to assume that you've had at least one generation of stars, and then you have um, certain characteristics of this body that's going to produce life. And these are the usual ones you hear over and over. Liquid water, which implies a certain temperature and pressure. Now, you might be able to argue about using other solvents. I know one person followed up with me on that, and I sent um, a paper by Steve Benner. If other people are interested in some of those arguments, I'm more than happy to send around papers. Um, biogenic elements. And again, I'm, I'm saying that we already are now in our second generation of stars. So those are available in the universe, but obviously you want them locally. You don't want to have to FedEx out to Alpha Centauri for your biology. Genic elements, and here we're talking mostly about C H O N S P. I guess usually it's done Schnapps P S, but anyway, it really doesn't matter. However, it's easier for you to remember these because you certainly would want to. Um, Life on Earth also uses little smidgens of things like magnesium and iron and so on, which are incredibly important, but we use very little. Um, you need a source of energy. And ultimately, most life on Earth today uses the sun as energy, and we'll talk about that. You need time. And this is something that's interesting. People talk about, oh, you need time. You need millions of years or billions of years and so on. Where do they get that number from? Who knows? Um, I think that there's a certain gut feeling that you know we are, we life forms are incredibly complex, whatever that's supposed to mean, and therefore it must have taken a long time for us to arise. I mean, wouldn't you feel a little hurt and insulted if it turns out it took 20 minutes to form life? And the free game is like, that was it. It takes me longer to eat dinner. I mean, you know, it, so I think people think it must have taken a long time and the statistical chance of having you know, this molecule evolve an autocatalytic RNA that then, you know, is able to do something must have taken a long time by chance. But we don't know. We have no idea. You know, maybe it did take 20 minutes under the right conditions once there are some prebiotic molecules that were rained in from, you know, from the extraterrestrial sources like um, Lou Alamandola is talking about and Bill Warnick was talking about a little bit. I don't know. Okay, so time, time is there with a question mark because we really don't know. So would we be organic chemists? And I think this is probably the second or third time I've strongly suggested that we would be. We would be based on organic carbon if you played it again. Um, and therefore, it seems to be the language of chemistry of the universe. Um, I just have to give you an aside. There was a, a faculty dinner for hum, hum Bio the other day, and some of the faculty were discussing students who wanted to go to med school but didn't want to take chemistry or organic chemistry. And so I went around the table and I said, well, that's fine. From an astrobiology perspective, we discussed the fact that your organic chem book and your biochem book would be the same if you were a student on Alpha Centauri. So, you know, you got to get over it. And they just they thought it was very funny. 
Um, but I didn't. I mean, the fact is, it's not just to get into med school here. You basically would have a similar textbook to get into medical school on any planet. Is that scary? Really scary. But at least it shows that whatever you're learning in organic chem here will be transferable when you move to another planet. So I'm going to argue that if we replay the tape, we would still be organic chemists. We would still use roughly the same biochem book. Some of the details would be different. We might not have the same base pairs in our genetic material. There are plenty of other amino acids out there that we don't use. Glycine is a very simple one, so we probably would use that, but there are others that we might not use. There's a, a chance that we wouldn't use water as a solvent, although it works very nicely in some ways. And so the implication of all this is that if we're looking for life elsewhere, don't look for the really bizarre alien ones. I've even heard people in the Hollywood suggest looking for nitrogen-based life. I forget which movie that was. It was one of those, you know, sort of grade B showing on the airplane types. Um, nitrogen isn't going to work. It doesn't have that kind of versatile chemistry. It only has three bonds. You don't see huge nitrogen, you know, chemistries that could conceivably lead to anything interesting. I mean, I've nothing against nitrogen, but it's just not got the versatility that carbon does. And again, silicon would be secondary, but we don't see even that versatility in silicon. We're sitting on a large silicate rock, and yet we're not made of silicon. Okay, so it's not for lack of imagination that it's probably not worth looking for exotic forms of life elsewhere. Exotic meaning not based on organic chemistry and probably using water as a solvent. There are good reasons. And Again, I wouldn't have said this 20 years ago. This is all very hot off the press stuff. So let's look a little bit at how life evolved. So we're going to start with the idea now that we're based on organic chemistry. We've gone through a generation of stars. Organic chemistry is floating through the universe. And so that's what we're going to start with. Now, would we even have the same mechanisms of evolution? We're saying in evolution that you would have um, random mutations, random changes and that there is a different selection of, of um, differential selection of these random creatures, random mutation. And this selection could be based on whether these creatures move faster or were bigger or smaller or clever or whatever. Um, but maybe natural selection doesn't have to occur. Maybe it works, evolution could work in a random way. Or maybe you can have some kind of deterministic or contingent case. And I would certainly say that any of these are possible, that you wouldn't have to have natural selection. It is incredibly appealing logically. You wouldn't have to have it. And that's why I'm a little uncomfortable with NASA's definition of life that Andrew gave, saying that it's a creature that, is, that evolves by natural selection. And the fun thing about life, for those of you who aren't biologists in the room, is that you could probably go home and think of a crazy mechanism for how life evolves. I mean, just think of something as wild or as stupid as you wish. And there is probably some organism on planet Earth that has used that. There's an incredible diversity. Okay? So um, that's not even necessary, but natural selection is very appealing from an intellectual way, and so you're really talking about what's the primary mode of selection. Um, convergence, we've heard this before. I love this slide. Um, because it's, it's sort of the perfect example of convergence. Everyone else uses wings and bats and insects. Here we have thorns on a cactus, thorns on a rose, thorns on a th thorny acacia. And does anyone have an idea what that middle picture is up there? Porcupine. That's right, hindquarters of a porcupine. They have all converged on the same solution for saying, bug off. Okay? That's that's biology for bug off. <laughs> pH limits for life. We talked about that last week. Remember? <laughs> that if you want to live at very low pH, the simplest <laughs> thing is to keep the external environment out. The external environment's a lot of hydrogen ions. Pump them out. Get rid of them. And then you don't need to do very much. And um, these are just the equations for those of you who've forgotten it or might want to take a look at it later. All you're talking with pH is the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. And by the way, I, this is follows up on what I said, that I'd, I'd show you why you could go below pH zero. Um, one molar 
is um, of hydrogen ions is um, pH zero. So if you go above a one molar concentration, you're going below pH zero. So you can suddenly see that there is not this great cliff that you would fall off if you go below pH zero. It can be done. It can be done. So now that we've sort of fiddled around a little bit with some of the principles that we might see in biology and certainly some of the physical and chemical conditions or the prerequisites, let's just take photosynthesis as an example. <coughs> and let's take some of what we've just learned rambling through the first 15 minutes or so and apply that to this question of photosynthesis. And would that happen again? Now photosynthesis, I, I need hardly tell you, is an incredibly important thing on planet Earth. It is, it is basically what is powering the vast majority of living organisms, not to mention the fact that ultimately it's what's <coughs> powering our cars unless you use solar power. Um, the sun's energy drives planet Earth. Um, in fact, it's in essence a limitless source of power for the next five billion years or so. Um, you know, it's, nothing's forever. Um, about 198 watts per meter square reached the Earth's surface, and the plants out of this use, this, they say, 0.014%. Um, so we're hardly tapping into all this energy that the sun sends us, all this power. <coughs> so if an organism can use any of this, it's just fantastic. So if you are an organism that needs energy, and all of us do, of course, and you tap into the sun, and you get away from having to use organic carbon, because there's much more inorganic carbon, you've now become a photoautotroph, you're photosynthetic. This is a great idea, but would it happen again? And this just puts it in a very clear, pretty way. Phototrophy simply means to use light for energy, and autotrophy means that you're making your own organic carbon, so you're taking in CO2, or in a few cases, carbon monoxide, and you're turning that into organic carbon. Um, sugar is usually um, the first thing. And if you combine those two, you become a photoautotroph. Now, there are a few organisms that use the light to help take in organic carbon. Those are photoheterotrophs. And there are chemoautotrophs. There are all sorts of variations, but we're going to basically stick with this bottom line, a photoautotroph is, is like a plant or an alga or a cyanobacterium. They use light, they take in CO2, and they make sugar, which can be used to make all sorts of other things. Okay, so what we'll do is talk about photosynthesis as a special case of autotrophy, and then see if we have the necessary ingredients on the earth or elsewhere to have photosynthesis evolve again. Besides the necessary ingredients, you're going to need a selective pressure for this to occur if, if Darwinian evolution is your main motive of change. And is there any evidence to support this? So, again, you know, autotrophy or organisms, autotrophs are organisms who take CO2 or in some cases carbon dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide, and make organic carbon. And this is just to remind you the, the basic bottom line reaction that fuels planet Earth, most of it. Ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, it's a little 5-carbon sugar, and the enzyme ribulose-bisphosphate carboxylase <laughs> oxygenase, which many people today call it visco, and I know it sounds like a breakfast cereal, but it's easier than saying ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, which I'm very good at because I got my PhD on it, but not everyone is as good at saying that. It is the enzyme that takes ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, and combines it with carbon dioxide <coughs> to end up with an unstable six carbon intermediate, which then breaks down in the presence of water to two molecules of three phosphoglycerate, which are three carbons. So you've got five carbon, you add one, you get six carbon, you break six carbon down into two three carbons. So it, you, you can follow all the carbons there in the yellow, it's pretty simple. And then some of that goes off and regeneration into ribulose bisphosphate and so on. And that way we, we plants pull in CO2 into the biosphere. Now ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase, Rubisco, is the most prevalent protein in nature. 
Turns out it's not tremendously efficient. I didn't know that until a couple of months ago. It's not tremendously efficient. One of its big problems is it also can take oxygen. And if you add oxygen to ribulose one 5 bisphosphate, you break it down into a two carbon and three carbon sugar. So instead of being synthetic and making more organic material, you're actually breaking it down. And that's not so good um, because you, the whole idea of this operation is to make more. And so because it can do both, and because there's a whole lot more oxygen in the world than when life arose, um, it hasn't gotten rid of this other mechanism. So there's a ton of it out there, a ton. I mean, say more than, more than any other protein in the world. So this is what's powering all of this. This is what's going on out there without us even thinking about it. And that's what most autotrophs do. When did this evolve? And again, you've seen pictures like this in the last week or two. Some people think that the whole origin of life was tied up with autotrophy. Not necessarily photosynthesis now, just autotrophy. Because life arose by taking in CO2 and turning it into organic carbon on a clay or, or whatever. So in that case, autotrophy would be the primordial thing that organisms do. That's very different from the sort of scenario, RNA world scenario that Andrew gave you. This is more of a metabolism first scenario. So some people think that autotrophy is tied into the origin of life. Um, it's, it's less likely. We do know that there were um, there was oxygenic photosynthesis at least um, at least two uh, billion years ago. May have been much earlier. Um, certainly, other sorts of autotrophs, non-photosynthetic and non-oxygenic photosynthesizers, were probably a good deal earlier. We do know that the Earth went through this great oxidation event. Um, this is something that was argued about quite a bit at this, this meeting. It was about somewhere between 2.1 and 2.4 billion years ago. The Earth went from basically being anaerobic at a global level to having um, at least some atmospheric oxygen that you could do something with, about um, 0.01 <coughs> present atmospheric levels of oxygen. That's what PAL stands for there. So there was this huge change in the oxidizing potential of our atmosphere, huge change in the amount of oxy oxygen at this great oxidation event. Now, that was caused by oxygenic photosynthesizers. So we know that there must have been an enormous number of them to cause this great oxidation event. Obviously, they must have arisen before that. And as I've said to you before, evolution works in little, slow, a little, you know, uh, spatial scales. So you wouldn't have needed a whole you know, planet full of photosynthesizers from time dot. They may have gone through their first um, even billion years of history in just little isolated patches, not enough to change the composition of the atmosphere. So we don't really know how far back. We do know that their fossils, way back to almost the earliest fossils, where the filaments are pointed towards the sun, which suggests that they were using the sun for something. It's not just all random. So again, there's circumstantial evidence, there's, there's carbon isotope evidence that there was autotrophy and possibly photosynthesis very, very early in evolution. Now, what's interesting is I've given you the Calvin cycle, Calvin Benson Basham cycle, which is sort of the big people plant um, carbon fixation photosynthesis cycle we all think about. But it turns out that there are a couple of other major pathways that organisms, and here we're talking these other cases of, of other bacteria, that use different pathways to take in CO2, or in some cases, carbon monoxide. Um, the reverse TCA cycle, which is sort of a playing the Krebs cycle in reverse. Hydroxypropionate pathway, which is used by a couple of organisms, including some of the ones I showed you from Yellowstone. The reductive acetyl-CoA pathway, um, and then there's some sort of funky things with the ribulose monophosphate pathway and the serine pathway, um, which we're not going to go into. So even organisms who take in CO2, there are a couple of major pathways that are used on planet Earth today, even though the big one that all plants use, all cyanobacteria, all algae, and even a whole bunch of other sorts of bacteria, is this um, Calvin cycle with the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase. It gives me a chance to show a picture of the skin desmos. So you know what that's all about. But let me show you this reverse TCA cycle. It is so grossly different from the Calvin cycle. It bears no resemblance whatsoever. And yet, 
there are a certain number of organisms that use this, like the green sulfur bacteria. Um, there are people, like Hal Morowitz, who believe that this is the primordial carbon fixation cycle. This was the first one. That, if you look at the TCA cycle, it seems to be so central in metabolism. You know how sometimes you see, you go up to a, um, a chem lab or whatever, and you see this huge chart of metabolic pathways in organisms, and it's very tiny print, and you can't possibly read it without an electron microscope? Well, right in the center of that tends to be things like the TCA cycle. And so it's been argued that this is the fundamental cycle for being an organism. And so having a reverse TCA cycle, it also suggests might be a very early sort of cycle. I'm somewhat agnostic on this because as I've mentioned more than once, I'm not a chemist. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thought that maybe this Calvin cycle that we all rely on today was not even the first one. It's just the one that managed to take over for whatever reason. I'm not going to bore you with all the other cycles, but um, it's all in my paper, which I sent out for review last week. And again, people are fascinated by how carbon gets into our biosphere. I would be delighted to send it to you, or we can post it, um, and you can read it and have a good, you know, good laugh or whatever. Okay, now photosynthesis is a specialized trophy. So we've now talked about how you get inorganic carbon into the biosphere. We need a source of energy for that. Um, in just regular carboxylation, regular carbon fixation, taking this inorganic carbon turned to organic, you need the inorganic carbon, of course. You need a reductant. You need energy. And you need an enzyme. Well, in photosynthesis, you need all of these things. It's exactly the same, but in this case, your source of energy is light. That's the photosynthesis. So we get back to, again, can photosynthesis arise again? Well, let's go through these four prerequisites. What about inorganic carbon? The end of the class period, I think last Tuesday, I went through this slide. This is redrawn from Jim Caskey. Remember, we talked a little bit about the faint young sun. And a way to counteract the fact that the sun was less luminous when life arose was having more gases in the atmosphere, more greenhouse gases. And CO2 has been one of the big ones. We also now think methane could have been involved in, in some other compounds. Um, this was a paper that was written in the late 80s, and this was assuming that the majority of the greenhouse gases up there would have been CO2. And you can see, if you, if you play that game, that when life arose, you know, let's just <coughs> take a number out of a hat, you know, about 3.5 billion years ago in the Archean, that there could have been literally orders of magnitude more CO2 in the atmosphere than today. Now, even if that's not true, even if it was always roughly the same, we have good evidence that it was substantially higher than it is today. Whether it was orders of magnitude or not, we don't know. But it was certainly no lower and probably much higher. And there's plenty today. We don't need to worry much about CO2. Mars has plenty of CO2 in its atmosphere. CO2 seems to be around. Inorganic carbon is not going to be the problem. What about reductants? Well, we've talked about um, oxygenic photosynthesis. The reason it's oxygenic is because these organisms use water as a reductant. They strip off the electrons, and they use that for the reducing power. So you've got, as a waste product, oxygen. So what you're breathing right now is a waste product from plants. Of course, we're breathing out CO2. That's our waste product, and they're more than happy to take that in and, and give you some nice new sugars. So that's, that's the bottom line. We're sitting here breathing the waste products of plants. But does it have to be water? Because as I've told you before, oxygen is a dangerous thing. You, there are all sorts of potential for oxidative damage from hydroxyl radicals and hydrogen peroxide and superoxide anions and so on. So if you want to play with water, you uh, better be prepared that it could be dangerous. So here's this oxygenic photosynthesis that I've been describing on the right, and that's what all plants algae, cyanobacteria, and certain other bacteria do. So most things that you think about are doing this oxygenic photosynthesis. <coughs> but there are a lot of organisms that are anoxygenic autotrophs, in fact, anoxygenic photosynthesizers. And they can use everything from metallic sulfur to nitrate and um, nitrite and hydrogen gas and iron and so on as a source of reducing power. 
So there's a huge variety. So you don't even have to have the water. You don't have to play the oxygen game if you don't want to. And you can still be photosynthetic. So that's suggesting that the ability to use different reductants is convergent. What about energy? Um, how do we capture light and turn it into, um, into some sort of chemical energy we can use? Well, we know that there's plenty of light on the Earth. I just threw this in because periodically I have to show a NASA picture. And this is solar insulation. You can get things like this off the web. There's far more that strikes the Earth even in the gloomy months of winter in the northern <coughs> latitudes than we could possibly use. Not a problem with solar insulation. The problem is how do you get all of this energy out there in the form of photons into a form that we can use into chemical energy? Well, again, we look for convergence. What most <coughs> organisms use today is chlorophyll, most photosynthetic organisms. And there are a couple of different flavors of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll A is the one that is sort of your basic one for all eukaryotes and cyanobacteria. But there's also chlorophyll B, which all plants have. That's what's making it a little bit darker green out there instead of a pale green. There are a certain number of algae that just have chlorophyll A. There are organisms that have chlorophyll A and C, like the diatoms and the dinoflagellates. It's the sort of thing you take a good course in protistology, you memorize all these things. Um, there are other sorts of chlorophylls, even potentially among the eukaryotes. There are certainly other chlorophylls among the prokaryotes. There's bacterial chlorophyll A and B and so on. They're fairly similar, but not identical. But we can go beyond chlorophylls, carotenoids. Remember, we've talked about carotenoids as protective agents. Well, they can also pick up light and act as antennae compounds. Um, this is also true for phycobilins, which are found in the red algae. Um, remember I showed you the cyanidium last week in Yellowstone, and I said they're red algae. Trust me, I'm not colorblind. Well, it turns out red algae are red because of a phycobilly protein called phycoerythrin, which is red, as you might imagine, from the word erythrin. And they just simply don't have much of this phycoerythrin, so they don't look red. That doesn't mean that they're not perfectly good you know, card-carrying members of the red algae. They just don't happen to have a lot of this red pigment. So phycobilins can also pick up light. Retinols can. Interesting. Rhodopsins can, which may be even one of the most ancient systems. And if you look at some of these examples I've, I've drawn out there, or I've, I've snitched from other books, you can see that there's something that they have in common. There's something that sort of jumps out at you. Alternating single and double bonds. Really good for capturing light and sending it down the chain. So what are these are called? Are phytons. And that's what you seem to see in these light capturing pigments over and over. But otherwise, you can see that there's not an enormous amount of similarity in the structure among a lot of these. So they appear to be <coughs> convergent. So these are all biological compounds that can take light and turn it into chemical energy with more or less efficiency. So we've got light out there. We've got plenty of inorganic carbon. And there are multiple ways that organisms, even on Earth, have figured out how to take that light energy and turn it into chemical energy. And um, this just, um, this should have been probably in another lecture, but this just reminds us that organisms use different parts of the solar spectrum for different sorts of activities. But let's not take any time on it. Let's move on to the last thing, and that's carboxylating enzymes. Remember I said you need an enzyme to take that inorganic carbon and bring it into the organic realm, turn it into a sugar or a protein or whatever, case of carbon fixation, it's usually sugar is an autotrophy. Well, isn't this scary? It turns out there are at least 14 different carboxylating enzymes known. This includes some of the ones I showed you in those alternate autotrophy pathways, like the reverse TCA cycle and so on. But it includes a lot of other odd things, like urea carboxylase, biotin carboxylase, acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And you know, I, there's a little wombat. And I just thought it was kind of a fun thing to throw up to remind us that even carboxylation makes us fat. Carboxylation is a crucial step in fatty acid synthesis. So it turns out the ability to take CO2 and bring it into the biosphere is not solely the province of animals, uh, excuse me, of plants, because animals do too, including blood clotting cascade, it's gamma carboxylation, all sorts of things. 
we don't use these carboxylate mechanisms to make lots more biomass. So we're not, this is not in any way a substitution for photosynthesis. It's only to say that the ability to take inorganic carbon and bring it into the organic realm has evolved multiple times. This may be partly because CO2 is somewhat amorphous from a, a chemical point of view. But the fact is that it's happened over and over and over again. This is something that's really struck me in particular over the last um, 20 years. Uh, that there's so many carboxylating enzymes out there. And finally, selection pressure. And um, I think probably what I'm going to do, because this makes a really nice story then taking us all the way back to Darwin, is um, I'm going to give you a few minutes to stretch now so that we can get, get through the rest of the really hardcore evolution stuff, because I want you to really pay careful attention. <coughs> it's not written anywhere. So stretch, and then we'll get back to it. I've argued that we would have had plenty of organic, inorganic carbon on the Earth if we ran it again. Um, that's probably true on other planets we hold near and dear. Um, source of reductant, there are plenty of different reductants that organisms use on the Earth, so there certainly is versatility, and no doubt there will be something or another available, including water. Energy in the form of light, plenty of light around um, if you're a certain distance from your home planet, uh, excuse me, your home star. Obviously, at some point, there's not a whole lot of light. Um, how much you need is kind of an interesting question. I got a um, query from the press the other day. There are people who are claiming that that um, one micromole of photons per meter squared per minute per second would be enough. This is a level that I wouldn't trust my meter reading. Um, a nice sunny day would be about 2,000 micromoles. Um, so you can imagine how dark one would be. So I don't know exactly what the limit is. It's something that's of great interest. But you do need some kind of light, obviously, for photosynthesis. Um, my good friend colleague, Ewan Nisbet, has even suggested that originally you could have had photosynthesis arising as a heat sensing mechanism in a hydrothermal vent, because you're very close there on that borderline to visible radiation. So there, there are possibilities here. But we'll stick with light. If you're anywhere near your parent star, you probably have enough light. Um, I've argued that there are tons of carboxylating enzymes on the Earth that have arisen convergently. And so apparently it's not all that difficult to, to have a carboxylate enzyme arise. And then the final thing you need to put the whole thing together is some selection pressure. Why would anyone want to bother photosynthesizing? Um, I'm going to argue that it is very easy to envision evolutionary pressure. Um, this is maybe the first picture you've seen this semester of Darwin when he was a young man. This is before he had a whole pile of kids and got married and so on. And so you can draw your own conclusions from that. You're probably used to seeing him with a gray beard. Um, we, all, we all get older eventually. Let's try the argument that I'm going to give you. First, that life on Earth is based on organic carbon. You've heard me say this lecture after lecture. And it's, the reason I keep harping on it is I think it's absolutely key to everything that came after. Most of the carbon in the universe is inorganic. Um, even though Lou Alamandola showed us organic molecules that we found in the interstellar medium, the ones that they synthesized in the lab under um, simulation conditions, and even though we know it's raining in as dust and meteorites and so on, the fact is that even on the Earth, there is much more inorganic carbon than organic, and we are a life-infested planet. So anywhere else, even <coughs> though there may be a fair amount of organic carbon, chances are there's going to be vastly more inorganic carbon. So what you're doing is setting up a situation for limitation. Um, I've talked to you before about life being lazy, or to put it maybe a little more scientifically, we strive for efficiency. The reason is that we would rather use that energy for making babies. That's the whole name of the game in Darwinian evolution, right? You want to leave offspring. You don't want to waste your time doing other sorts of things that you don't have to do. You want to stay efficient so you can maintain that competitive edge and get your genes in the next generation. And finally, something that I don't think I have harped on you about, but I think is a really important point. And again, my apologies to the engineers in the room. I realize we have a split room. But the fact is that evolution is not an engineer. 
evolution is much more like a tinkerer working in their garage. This is a wonderful metaphor that Francois Jacob um, put in a paper in the 70s, and I'll get you the reference. Maybe we can even just put the PDF up on the website. It's a very short paper, and it's a great one to have in the back of your mind as a way to think about how evolution works. A tinker in their garage uses what's available. Okay, you say, well, you know, it may not be optimal to use this size nail. I really would rather use a hook, but I'll take the nail and I'll bend it and it'll work because I'm here and it's here and that's that. That's how evolution works. I don't, you know, a fish doesn't say, gee, I'd really like to, when I grew up, become a kangaroo. So I'll see what would be the maximum efficiency for jumping and dealing with the desiccation land. No, that's not how it works. It's step by step with the raw material that you already have. So evolution is a tinker, not an engineer. That's really important to remember. And finally, I mean, certainly contingency occurs. Say, you know, asteroids dump on the Earth and you have mass extinctions and so on. Bad luck, it's not your fault. You did the best you could. You were highly evolved to your environment. It's not your fault this huge rock land on your head one day and all your friends and relations. Okay, so yes, contingency occurs, but we're going to focus on the other aspects because that's what you can predict. Okay, now follow this argument. Because you've got all these preconditions, you have that um, you have originally selection for whatever organisms can use the organic material that's around. And there are some people, of course, who think that the very first organisms used were autotrophic. I'm suggesting that they used whatever was in this organic soup that was rained in from outer space or formed, um, formed in the atmosphere through lightning or, or whatever sort of mechanisms. They used what the organic carbon was around. But eventually, there's going to be a limitation for our organic carbon. As I said, even on Earth today, we have much more inorganic carbon than organic carbon. So at some point, available organic carbon is probably going to be limiting. Now, this is a crisis if you're making your body out of organic carbon. So what do you do? There's really not a whole lot of choice. Um, you know, you're not going to go make your body on something else. So you make your own organic carbon. You say, all right, there's plenty of inorganic around. I'll make my own. This is not, I don't think necessarily your first choice because you want to be efficient and it would be easier to just take in organic matter. But it is something you may have to come to. There may be this great organic carbon crisis occurring early on. Now, if, I'm getting ahead of myself though, um, once you have an organism that makes their own organic carbon, and again, remember life is lazy or life is efficient, whichever way you want to put it, what do you do if you're smart? You eat the guy who's making his own organic carbon. So you become a herbivore. Makes a lot of sense. You've got a nice, balanced, nutritional diet. You may have to spit out the cell walls, but you know, whatever. You've got food. You don't have to go to the trouble of capturing energy and making your own. You're now dependent on the autotrophs, but it's less energy. So you're, you've got a selection now for herbivory. Now, as I said, you may have to spit out the cell walls and so on, so if you want an even more efficient creature, you have a carnivore, someone who eats the herbivores. And this is something that's happened more than one time, this whole chain of events in evolution. We see this among you know, multicellular organisms, we see it among unicellular organisms, if such a thing exists, and so on. So I firmly believe that if life is based on organic carbon, and if there's more inorganic, which we know there is in the world, and so on and so forth, that there would be this sequence of events that would occur on any planet. So you would end up with these nutritional groups. So again, I can't predict that you would end up at Stanford again, but I could predict that the, the, the organisms that ended up at Stanford were carnivores, because they're going to get the most energy. And they are relying on herbivores, and some of them are and the plants directly, who had to form because there was an organic carbon crisis. Now, what, what evidence do I have for any of this? Why should you even bother to do this? Well, turns out I've done a few experiments over the years. Um, other people have done a few that were not directed at this. Um, because of questions that came up, I made my daughter do a further one for science fair this week. And we all came up with the same thing. And that is that if you look at 
a photosynthetic organism and you give them a certain concentration of sugar, they'll say, great, it's here. I'm, you know, I'm eating it. Why bother making my own? In this particular case, I went back to Nymph Creek there, that's what I looked like when I was younger. Um, and during the course of the day, we measured photosynthesis. If you look at the orange curve, you see the control. So this was photosynthesis rates in Nymph Creek, just, you know, that's the way it was. Now, if we added 25 millimolar acetate, which is a little, little two-carbon fragment, already fixed, nice little digestible organic bit, um, they shut down their photosynthesis quite a bit and use the acetate instead. We did some other experiments with a, a little alga, Pyreocomonas malamensis, which is a well-known mixotroph. A mixotroph can either photosynthesize or ingest organisms, so it can be a heterotroph or an autotroph. Um, and in this particular case, when we grew them in the light with bacteria, they photosynthesized at the rate you see with the speckled pattern. In the light, no bacteria, there was much more photosynthesis, and in the dark with bacteria, there was none. Now, obviously, in the dark, they're not going to have any photosynthesis because there's no light, so they're missing a prerequisite. But look at that. If there was no bacteria to eat, they photosynthesize more. If the bacteria were there, hey, why bother? Let's eat them. Okay, so they cut way down in their photosynthesis. So there is an in indication from experiments like that that autotrophy evolved because it had to, because there was a selective pressure for organisms who could make their own organic carbon. Okay, so let's look for, um, let's not talk about convergence in enzymes. But we, do, we did talk a little bit earlier that there's a convergence in the carboxylating enzymes that raises our confidence level that it could happen again. Um, oh, even among plants, there's more than one carboxylating enzyme. I'm sure many of you are familiar with C4 plants and CAM plants. What these are are plants that have a, a second carboxylating step, it's actually one first, as a way to bring up the concentration of CO2 inside to present to their rubisco. So they actually fix carbon dioxide first on phosphoenol pyruvate, which is a little three carbon jobby, and then that is released to the Calvin cycle. It's brought in and pyruvate is regenerated and it just cycles through. So the idea is you've got this little three carbon sugar, it grabs the CO2 first, brings it in, and presents it to the rubisco, and then it goes back and gets some more. So it's sort of a shuttle mechanism to bring CO2 in. So even among what you would consider regular plants, there's an extra carboxylating step in autotrophy, where there can be in, in many plants. Um, I found something else really interesting when I started to put this paper together. Um, biotin. Who remembers biotin from biochemistry? I can't say that was one of those things that really stuck out as the highlight of my junior year of college. But then I started looking at it. Biotin is a mobile carrier of activated CO2. That sounds like it's right out of a biochem text, doesn't it? You read that all right. And you go, wait, whoa. It is a carrier of CO2. So it's this little module that is very good at taking CO2 and delivering it. And it turns out that not all, but maybe a half a dozen of these carboxylating enzymes use biotin as, as a way. So in a way, you're, you're be more, well again, a tinkerer. You've got this component here that can take CO2 from point A to point B, so you evolve to combine yourself with biotin, and voila, you've got a carboxylating system. Pretty clever, eh? So there's a, a modular case. Here's an example where biotin's used. Pyruvate carboxylase. So you've got pyruvate, and it forms a complex with biotin and this enzyme pyruvate carboxylase. And therefore, the CO2 is right in proximity. It carboxylates the pyruvate. You end up with an oxaloacetate. And the biotin is now free with a pyruvate carboxylase to find another CO2 and start all over again. Yeah. So again, I know you've been through much of this before if you've had to take home bio core or if you've taken biochemistry. But once you go back and look at it with fresh eyes, you go, wow, that's really cool. Biotin is sort of this little unit that you can borrow to make yourself carboxylate. Um, I've shown you those pigments. Um, 
I think I've even shown you this slide before, is to remind you that even on top of all those enzymes and the convergence there, we see convergence in organisms that want to be autotrophic. They want to be autotrophic so badly they swallow an organism that's already figured out how to be autotrophic. And remember that the origin <coughs> of photosynthesis in eukaryotes involved <coughs> swallowing a cyanobacterium, turning that cyanobacterium into a chloroplast. But there are other organisms that are not photosynthetic who then swallowed some of those organisms. And so you have a secondary, secondary endosymbiosis um, in the case there are things like the cryptomonads and then the dinoflagellates, of course, and the uh, coccolithophores, if these mean anything to you, they should, diatoms, all these wonderful things uh, like that, all these other photosynthetic protists with chlorophyll A and C, apparently it was a, a secondary endosymbiosis. Why do we know? There's a smoking gun in there, the number of membranes around their chloroplast. Some of these, like the cryptomonads I mentioned, have a nucleomorph, so they still have the remnant of the first nucleus. So all sorts of smoking guns sitting there inside these eukaryotic cells. And this has happened over and over again. So could photosynthesis evolve again? Sure. The ingredients are there. There's a lot of data from, um, from convergence. We see that this evolutionary pressure would occur again on the Earth. It would occur anywhere. So could photosynthesis evolve elsewhere? Yeah, sure. Why not? There's plenty of inorganic carbon out there, certainly relative to organic carbon. Um, and it's likely that there would be carboxylating enzymes evolving and so on. So that was sort of the big lump of photosynthesis. And so what I'd like to do is just give you one or two more examples of convergence in the biological world to suggest areas that might well evolve again. But the big one that I really want you to take home is this whole idea of metabolism, all based on the fact that we're, we life are based on organic carbon and it's a limiting compound and therefore you go through all these series of steps. So let's go to um, symbiosis. We saw that occurring multiple times with the origin of photosynthetic organisms, but it's also true with the origin of all mitochondria being photosynthetic. Remember I mentioned that they came from alpha proteobacteria. There are many, many other examples of symbiosis. I took out the picture, but Coral reefs are a perfect example. You've all heard about coral reef leaching in the newspapers. What it is is saying they're losing their endosymbionts. They're losing their algae. Bad news for the corals. There are lots of jellyfish. There are all sorts of organisms that take in endosymbionts. Um, in fact, termites. You know, termites don't digest wood. Did you know that? They have bacteria and possibly the protozoa too in their hindgut that do that for them. Cool stuff. So, in fact, if you completely wiped out the intestinal flora, as it's still called, from a termite, they would die of starvation sitting on a piece of wood. They couldn't digest the wood. Okay? So symbiosis is very common in the world, fund, uh, uh, lichens, all sorts of things. Multicellularity, I've already hinted that that's not so special. Um, there are many people who seem to feel very proud of the fact that we're multicellular new, you know, those microbes, are single cell. But as I've mentioned before, there are many, many cases of multicellularity, <coughs> even within some of these groups like, um, who here has heard of clammy pneumonas, little one-celled alga? No? Oh. Stanford needs a good protistology course. It's <laughs> clear. Um, even in that, it's a very, very common little one-celled green alga. And it looks very much like a single cell plucked from a ball box. And in fact, if you go in that, whole group, there's uterina, pandorina, all sorts of algae that are basically multiple units of clamidomonas. Um, and even in there, it looks like it occurred more than once. So multicellularity is very nice. Um, you can be proud of it, but I wouldn't brag too much. Um, it's, not, it's not that big a deal in that it seems to be highly convergent. And again, remember, evolution tries everything. The microbes are much better than we are, certainly the bacteria and the archaea, at being metabolically diverse. They've also been clever about going about light harvesting in different ways. They do all sorts of things. But the instant they turn multicellular, we say, oh, they're multicellular, they're, so they're one of us. You know, we, and, and we separate them off. If we were a bacterium doing taxonomy, we'd say, 
you know, all those eukaryotes, they're all the same, you know, we'll just lump them in a side group. And, and their main criteria are going to be whether you can use iron or sulfur for respiration. Now that's something big. So you got to remember that, that multicellular is wonderful, we wouldn't be here without it, but it's a highly, highly convergent characteristic. And I've, I've told you all that before, there are huge advantages to multicellularity. Um, if you're large, you, you've got uh, thermal inertia, you've got all sorts of issues, so that's great. Transition to land, going from the water to the land, that's happened so many times. We think that the main transition in both cases had to do with the fact that at high temperatures, gas is more or less soluble. I, I sent you home with bottles of Coke and Pepsi last week. Did anyone try that? Gas is more or less soluble at high temperature. Surely less, one of you knows my less, name. Less, less, huh? less, less. less soluble at high temperature. Thank you. You're excused from the Coke can experiment this weekend. <laughs> the rest of you, stick a Coke can in hot water and see what happens. Okay? It's less soluble. So if you are, say, a fish and you need oxygen, or you're an alga and you need CO2, and your lake is starting to warm up, and maybe on top of your, you're at a high altitude, so there's not much gas to begin with, where are you going to go as the solubility of the gas goes down? Where can you go to get your oxygen, your CO2? Out of the water, into the atmosphere. Now this is risky, because once you leave the water, you're in a highly desiccated situation. You've got to worry about your own water loss, and that is not trivial. You also have to worry more about temperature regulation, because temperature changes much faster once you're out of the water. There are all sorts of things, okay? But there are also some great new niches out there. It's a wonderful thing. But the transition to land occurred many, many times. Um, skin color. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but my um, friend Nina Jablonski, who was head of anthropology at the California Academy of Sciences, and now is at Penn State, has done some really wonderful work on the evolution of skin color. And I've heard her mention many times that this is something that's highly malleable. Now, her idea with her <coughs> husband, George Chaplin, is that it's very much tied in with UV radiation. Now, many people have thought that it could be tied in with UV, that you have darker skin in areas with higher UV as a way to prevent skin cancer. But she quite rightly says that's stupid, actually, because skin cancer occurs post-reproductively. You've already produced your children for the most part. So who cares from an evolutionary point of view? But in fact, UV is also really important in folic acid destruction and the production of vitamin D. Now, folic acid is incredibly important in neural tube development. So if you're destroying your folic acid as a, as a pregnant woman from too much UV, particularly early in pregnancy, you may well be develop, destroying your chances of your fetus being able to be born with a functioning notochord and therefore obviously surviving. So that would be very strong evolutionary pressure to have the ability to regulate how much UV is coming through your skin. Now, of course, people whose ancestry is where the UV is very high have very dark skin. People who live in areas where UV is very <coughs> limiting have very light skin because they need as much UV as they can to make vitamin D, otherwise you end up with rickets and so on. And people from the middle latitudes have much more ability to adjust the amount of pigment in their skin depending upon the UV dose. And looking around the room, I would say most people in here are in that, everyone in here is in that category where they're adjusting in the summer, right? So it's, it's an exquisitely finely adapted thing to the environmental conditions. So skin color is something that's happened over and over again, back and forth. And I'm pretty sure Nina wrote a book a year or two ago um, on skin color, the natural, natural history of skin color, something of that nature. I can look it up for you. You could, you could Google her in just a second. And I would suggest if it's written <coughs> one-tenth as well as she speaks, it would be a fascinating book. Um, last year or so, there was a, a crocodile found that looks an awful lot like a Tyrannosaur and a Velociraptor. Look at that in the two hind legs. Clear case of convergence in morphology. I just thought that was so cool. 
Um, it has nothing to do with anything except another really cute example of convergence. And now for the real glow for this class. I say, you know, astrobiology is nothing but depressing. The universe is going in 100 billion years, and, you know, the sun's going in a couple of billion, and the moon's leaving. Now you find out, it, and then there's life all over the place. Intelligence isn't all that special. Um, to be a good heterotroph, to be a good predator, you need to be able to move. You need sensory ability. Um, these are all good reasons to develop intelligence, right? And intelligence doesn't all have to be, you know, scoring well in your SATs. It's also the ability to, to chase after prey successfully, having nervous responses, um, coordinated movement. Um, in our case, it's not just being a predator, but we are long-lived species, and so we are not very good at, at just changing our population structure very quickly to deal with the pollutant. I mean, the, the really classic example they give in biology of, of mimicry are the moths that they think um, responded to the Industrial Revolution in, um, in England by having a population structure where they were darker and harder to see on trees when the pollution was higher. I think that's um, now in some question. But that kind of thing can be done fairly quickly if you're a moth. You can change the population structure fairly quickly. If you're a creature like us that's got a generation time of probably a you know, minimum of 14 or 15 years, and in our case at this point, far longer, you don't have that kind of ability to be that flexible. And so you think of things that are long-lived, like um, elephants. They have a lot of corporate memory. There's a reason that the grandmother leads the troop. Um, and in our case, our intelligence allows us to be highly flexible in a variable environment and still maintain a long generation. <coughs> now, this is the sort of chart that I had to memorize when I took a class on vertebrates, so a class on, on mammals, because I felt that I ought to take one on vertebrates since we're all vertebrates. Um, they don't teach that anymore. Now, they say that the mammals are in four major groups. And let's look at that in a little bit more astrobiological sense. Two of the groups, we believe, originated in the south. The Xenarthra, which are the sloths, anteaters, and armadillos. And the Aphrotheria, that's a very evocative name, isn't it? The Tenrex, golden bulls, round-eared elephant shrews, lesser elephant shrews, aardvarks, manatees, hyrax, elephants, all sorts of really interesting things. Okay, now, the feeling is that branching off from there are the lower Asiathera, which includes, you know, such notables as the hedgehog, shrew, mole, bats, flying fox, whale, porpoise, hippo, ruminants, pigs, llamas, horses, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's a little llama. And another main um, group, the U Archonta and the Gleries, um, which includes the mouse rat, porcupines, um, rabbits, pikas, flying lemurs, tree shrews. Humans? What do you know? So there are all these groups that all have examples of intelligence in them. Whoops, don't tell me. I managed to leave off the elephant. Of course, intelligence there too. So we've got in at least three of the groups convergence on intelligence. We've got the porpoises and whales, we've got elephants, and um, we certainly have humans. <coughs> we have convergence of the aquatic, ability to live in an aquatic environment, even though our ancestors' mammals was not aquatic. And you see similar sorts of adaptations. There's no point in having a lot of hair. There is a lot of point in having a lot of fat for insulation. And so therefore you shrink your limbs just the way I talked at the beginning of the lecture about when you go towards the poles, you want to shrink your limbs to keep body temperature up decrease your surface area to volume ratio, same sort of thing if you're going to be in the water. You can lose heat pretty quickly. Convergence of fossorial mammals. These are ones that dig. And there you see a mole and um, a golden mole, and they have the same sort of convergent morphology. <coughs> Ant eaters even are found all over. I mean, who would, who would think that that would be such a hot thing to be? But ant eaters apparently, you know, hot, hot topic. And so you've got it evolving multiple times. So what I'm trying to show you is that when you see convergence, particularly many cases of convergence, you get the idea that it may not be that 
difficult to evolve that, that it was not a one-off situation. And yes, if we replay the tape, it would happen again, given the same starting materials and same evolutionary pressure. Obviously, if you're going to be an anteater, you want to have lots of ants in the world. What's the role of the environment in all this? In the environment versus natural selection. Now, again, most of you probably remember from biology classes, the talk is constantly about competition. But in fact, if you look at the very early Earth, or you look at some of these extreme environments, there's not a lot of competition. Your main problem is the physical environment. And so what I'm suggesting is the struggle for existence in an extreme environment or on the early Earth where you have very little biomass is really dealing with the environment. You can do that. There's plenty of niche space available to you. Uh, you also have to deal with entropy, obviously. Um, secondarily, then, there is biology, as, as, um, as Spencer pointed out, nature red in tooth and claw, this sort of competition view that is so associated with Darwinian evolution. We'll talk about more on Darwin's birthday. Um, but even in this physical sense, there's convergence and there's certain predictive power. And this, I'll just throw this out as one thing. We see between about 400 and 750 nanometers, I've said this more than once, that's the same light range that plants photosynthesize in. Now there's a good reason for this. We're based on organic carbon. I sound like, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is your commercial announcement. This is your pledge break. You are based on organic carbon. What does that mean? Because you're based on organic carbon, UV is dangerous. We went through that last week with stream files. UV is hazardous. So if you're going to use photons to see or to photosynthesize, better off staying a little bit clearer of the UV. But when you get too long, there's not a whole lot of energy there. And so you want to avoid really relying on stuff that's uh, wavelengths are too long. There are a few bacteria that can excess, you know, up to 800, 850 nanometers and so on. But they are really forced to. That's the niche that was left and they, they did the best they could. And on top of it, if you look at the absorption of light by water, that's where the window is. So if your life is storing in an aquatic environment, um, which we could argue is likely because you don't have the desiccation problems, you have the solvent there and so on, that's the window that's available to you. So it's not only a great idea, that's what there is. And so, again, the chance is that if life arose elsewhere that was either using the sun as a source of energy or for vision, they would probably want to experience the world in the same visual range that we do. Cool. So, um, I have no idea where that last slide came from. So this is sort of the stuff that we went through today, and I'm going to pull that all together by making a suggestion. Um, we talked a little bit about Gould and, Mo and, and Simon Conway Morris and um, um, various other people. Now let's, let's see what we make of this sort of idiosyncratic view of life that I've given you in this argument. What I'm saying is that it, it all starts from being based on organic carbon. Evolution makes its way to localized adaptive peaks, depending upon what it can do, what it's easy to do, what's available. Um, but if we stand back, can we see certain patterns emerge? And I'm arguing that yes, we will see certain patterns emerge. And certainly, the most comfortable I feel is talking about metabolism. <coughs> Skin color and so on assumes we're already at the point where we're dealing with, with skin and, and being out in land and so on. And so what I'm suggesting is that if we replayed the tape, there would be certain broad brush things that we would see over and over again. These certain metabolic features that then have certain um, aspects coming with them. You need <coughs> pigment and therefore you've got colored organisms and you have UV protection problems and all these sorts of things that we've talked about. But in terms of the little adaptations, the little local adaptive peaks, it's difficult to predict those. Again, it's difficult to, to predict even five years ago whether you would have ended up at Stanford or Berkeley or Yale or who knows where. But the fact is now you're here and that's your little local adaptive <coughs> peak. Okay. Um, and that's where selection comes in, the little fine tuning. 
The big jumps have to do with what's available, what you can do, and sometimes it just, it's a bad hair day and an asteroid hits the earth and, you know, we all have a day like that. All right, so to sum this up, um, someone emailed me the other day and said they loved Gary Larson. I think I wrote back and said, so do I. So here's our first Gary Larson cartoon, I think, of the semester. And here's the dinosaur <coughs> up at a convention of dinosaurs right before that nasty little asteroid <laughs> struck. The picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climates are changing. So you're talking about change in the environment. The mammals are taking over. That's competition. And we have a brain about the size of a walnut, and that's biology. So it, it all comes together to make the pattern that we see today in the world. So I, I hope that I've twisted your minds a little bit and given you a little more food for thought. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.